Well, it's good to be with you. My name is Robert, and I have the joy of being the pastor here at Fellowship. If you're joining us in person or online for the first time, I want to say welcome. It's so good that you uh, could be with us. We are currently going through a journey that we've called The Land Between, and really what this series is, is going through the story of Moses. And so we're looking at Moses' journey as he goes from uh, this baby that we looked at in week one all the way to this uh, journey through uh, the desert around this mountain called Mount Sinai, which we got introduced to last week. And so in order to begin, uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 4, and I want to encourage you to take one of these black Bibles out. Uh, there'll be Bibles around you underneath the chairs. I'm going to have you mark your finger or put something in there for Exodus chapter 4, and you can turn there, and that's going to be page 49. We're at the very beginning of the Bible. And then the other chapter we're going to be looking at is Genesis chapter 17, which if you want to use one of these Bibles, it's, it's page 14. So we're really, really, really early on in the Bible. And as we do that, uh, a couple things. One, today's topic is one of the hardest topics of all the Bible. In fact, uh, the passage that we're going to look to is one where people would often point to, especially critics of our faith, and they would say, look, uh, this is your God. He's so mean. He's so horrible. Why would he do this? And I'll, I'll get to that. And so there's an element of this that it really it causes you to pause and stop. If you're doing the Bible through the year uh, with us, this is one of those passages that everyone kind of started saying, hey, look, this passage is weird. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's wacky. Like, what is going on? I think I'm ready to quit. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here, and we're going to dig into it. And so that's why we're in two chapters, because there has to be a lot of uh, context to what's happening in Exodus. But the other thing about it is what I see is to give our picture or to have our uh, head kind of wrapped around what we're going to be looking at, I want to give you a couple illustrations. The first is I was driving to an ice cream shop yesterday. And this seems super innocent, nothing crazy, right? Like, how's he going to talk about going to an ice cream shop? Well, we were racing our neighbors there by the speed limit. And we decided two different routes, which way was going to get there quicker. And all of a sudden, we get a call. Hey, where are you guys at? We're waiting outside the ice cream shop for you guys. And so what am I? I'm frazzled. So all of a sudden, I'm driving down the road. I've driven this road tons of times, and there's a big sign that says dead end street. And I go straight to the dead end. And Jessica looks at me, and she's like, you didn't see that sign? How often in our life are there warning signs, but we avoid them and we go off track? Today's text is God directing Moses in a time where he avoided a warning sign. There's another story, one a little bit more traumatic than missing a dead-end street. Uh, some of you might remember May of 1980. I remember going to Washington, the state, uh, out in the Pacific Northwest, and seeing this mount called Mount St. Helen for the first time. And my parents were telling me about what happened on Mount St. Helen and the volcanic eruption that took place. And I kind of was like, okay, interesting. Uh, but on May 20th, 1980, Mount St. Helen exploded. But did you know that for two months prior to the explosion or that massive uh, blast that was the most deadly and destructive in American history... There were earthquakes and volcanic activity that signaled that this major event was actually underway and happening. Authorities had plenty of time to sound the alarm and to warn those nearby of the looming disaster. It's not like it came out of the blue. Yet despite the seriousness of the threat, some people chose to disregard the warnings. Probably one of the best known is the man on the screen, Harry Randall Truman. Not the President Truman, but a different Truman. And this 83-year-old man was the owner and caretaker of something called Mount St. Helens Lodge. And while he had survived World War I and even being on a sinking ship, 
he was not able to leave this mountain because he chose not to. Prior to the eruption, Truman told reporters, I don't have any idea whether it will blow, but I don't believe it to the point that I'm going to pack up. On May 18, 1980, Truman and his lodge were buried beneath 150 feet of mud and debris. His body was never found, but the point to it is he avoided what? The warnings. In today's message, while it is tough, and while a lot of people are going to look to and say, is this really your God? I want you to think about God's warnings to us. And are we listening to them? And also you will see his grace and his mercy and his goodness, even when we avoid the warnings. Moses is one of the most influential people in all of religion, all of religion. Uh, all, take all the faiths. I actually, anyone familiar with chat GPT? It's the new AI bot that you can search. It's like cooler than Google, all right? I don't know about that. But anyway, so I just said, who had the greatest influence on religion in the world? And boom, five pop up. The first one, Jesus Christ. And I kind of got a little cocky, like, yeah, go Jesus. Even the AI world knows that Jesus is king. And then it went to Mohammed. And then it went to Buddha. And then it went to Confucius. Confucius. And then it said Moses. Not Abraham, but Moses. I find it interesting because when we think of Moses, when we talk of Moses, we just think of him as someone in the Bible, right? Moses had a great impact on world religion and also on our faith, but Moses was not a perfect man, and he made mistakes, unlike Jesus. And so today's passage, we get to see how Moses was stuck in between the land of indecision, and it cost him. But we must come from the perspective of the warning side. So we'll start in verse uh, 20, and if you remember... Moses had just seen this burning bush. He had had this holy encounter with God, and he saw it, and it was burning, and he was talking, and he kept saying, God, I'm not going to go, right? And God kept saying, go, you're going to free the people. I've heard their cry, and he said no, and, God, and they kind of had this like wrestling match of sorts. And eventually he caves, and he goes to his father-in-law Jethro, and he says, hey, i got to leave. And Jethro gives him his blessing, and he begins this journey. And so that's where we're at in verse 20. Moses takes his wife, his sons, he puts them on a donkey, and he heads back to the land of Egypt. In his hand, he carried the staff of God. This was the staff that he threw, and it became a snake, and all the things that God showed him to give him confidence in what he would do. And so we see that Moses now, eventually, he listens to God. He goes on his way. He's going to Egypt. He's going to do what God says. But then look what happens next. And the Lord told Moses, When you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. I commanded you, let my son go so he can worship you. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. We're going to get back to this passage right here. But God now is really getting, he's foretelling what is going to happen. And he's saying, look, Pharaoh's heart's going to get hardened. So much so that I'm going to have to go to this great length. And we'll get there. But here's the verse I want you to see. And this is the controversial verse. This is the one that people are like, can that really be God? On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to what? Kill him. Wait, Moses? This is the Moses that just saw the burning bush. This is the Moses that had, had fleed to Midian. This is the Moses that had even been put in that reed basket as, as a baby. He was protected by God in all of these ways. We saw him well, going through all of these things. We've gotten to this point, and all of a sudden God, while well, he's on his way back to Egypt to free God's people, is about to kill him? How could God do that? Man, God is horrible. 
And people will pause at this verse, and they'll look at this verse, and they'll say, see, that's the God you believe in, a God that would kill his own people. Why would God do this? While God had called Moses and had identified him as an Israelite, Moses had not held up his end of the bargain by solidifying himself as an Israelite. Do you remember at the burning bush where God for the first time says, Moses, Moses, and then he says, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He says, look, I am your God. And this is the Moses who to the world looked like an Egyptian. But now God is saying, no, you are an Israelite and you are going to free who he just said a sentence earlier, my firstborn son who is Israel. And all of a sudden, now this Moses, who has been given his identity by God, he has been identified as an Israelite by God himself, has not done something to, in his own heart, to actually say, accept that identity and say, yes, I am an Israelite. Well, what hadn't he done? We have to go back to Genesis chapter 17. And we have this event or encounter with another man and God. And the man is, can you guess it? Abraham. And it's called the Abrahamic covenant. And here in verse 9, and we'll follow, we'll see something that God says to Abraham. Then God said to Abraham, your responsibility I'm going to make you a great nation. This is what God had told him, right? I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand, the grains of sand on the seashore. You're going to be great. You're going to have descendants. And remember Abraham, he's like, but I don't even have babies. We're old. Like, God, this doesn't even make sense. And God says, no, 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 I'm going to make you a great people. But then, in verse 9, God said to Abraham, your responsibility What is it that Abraham had to do? This covenant, God said, I'm going to do these things, but you have something. Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and your descendants have this continual responsibility. There are two things in this sentence that we first have to note. Number one, there is a covenant between God and Abraham that is made, but guess what? There is two sides to the agreement. When two people come together and they get married, they say their vows to one another. It's not just up to one person to uphold their end of the agreement. It's up to the other person as well. That's how a covenant is kept. And God, with his people, made a covenant. And he said, look, you have an end of the bargain that you're to keep yourselves. Now, here's the other thing. Some people would say, but God set the terms of the covenant. That's not fair. Anyone work a job somewhere? Your employer set the terms of your agreement, and that's not fair. All right? God is the greatest employer we could ever have, and he set the terms of the agreement, and that was his covenant. All right? And we sign on that line if we agree to him or not. Just this week, uh, I drove my family nuts because all they're going to hear for the next week is the ding, 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 the pick is in as we watch the NFL draft. And what happens? Those players get drafted, and the owners of those teams set an agreement that they sign. And based on where they were drafted is based on how much money they make. Now, all of us could dream about making even the least amount of them. But the reality is the terms are already set. They don't come to the table and say, no, I want more. The owner determines the contract, and you agree to it. This is the same with God and Abraham. There's a contract, but it's up to Abraham, and as we're going to see the second part of it, his descendants to agree to it. So what does it say in verse 9? You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. Continual responsibility meaning ongoing. 
as Eugene Peterson in his uh, transliteration of the Bible would say, it says this in the message version, God continued to Abraham and you, you will honor my covenant, you and your descendants, generation after generation. In other words, this covenant isn't just between you and me, Abraham. This is for your kids and their 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 babies and on and on and on. This is for generation after generation until I, God, say that it no longer has to be. And so that's the covenant. And Moses is living in this covenant, under this covenant. But does he keep his end of the bargain? Well, what are the terms? Now, I'm going to say, this is where the Bible just gets crazy. Because sometimes the terms of the covenant, you're like, seriously, God, of all the things, this is what you're going to choose? Verse 10. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. Ouch! Like, that covenant hurts! He goes on, you must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Go, just take your kids and read the Bible to them and then explain everything to them. From generation to generation, he reiterates, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to the members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and to the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased Catch this, all must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. It doesn't matter. You can't say, well, I was raised as an Egyptian, so do I really count God? No. You can't make excuses. You're either in it or you're not. And in this agreement with Abraham, God covers all the bases. He goes, I don't care where you come. What, what your background is. I don't care where you're from. If you're on this covenant, this is what you do. But like, God, I'm like 72. I don't want to get circumcised. It doesn't matter. It's happening. And why circumcision? I'm not even going to ask God one day, all right? I mean, maybe. That and mosquitoes, the two things I always wonder about. But while this might seem strange, I want you to catch something. It's a physical mark between you and God, and it's private. You don't go around showing off your circumcision, do you? (laughs) Only God knows if it happened, right? And hopefully your spouse, but we'll save that talk for later. Only God knows. It's private. It's between you and him. But yet it took a physical, (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm getting some people laughing. It took a physical mark, right? But here's what's so cool about it. When did God say to have circumcision? Eight days. They don't let you stay in the hospital for eight days, but you either decide if your baby's leaving circumcised or not. And I'll never forget, I felt so bad as my two boys got rolled back to that procedure room for their circumcision. It was not some crazy uh, thing like this. And it, it, it was just like, they just were gone. And then they came back, and you could tell they were crying. And I'm like, man, I am so sorry, but you won't remember this. But what do they do when that happens? They inject a baby with what's called vitamin K because it stops the bleeding so that your blood can actually clot. Did you know that the baby's blood is not naturally able to handle a circumcision until it's eight days old? When you wonder why the Bible is amazing, it's because God knows how we work. And he says, wait till the eighth day. Why? Because your body can handle it. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, in your entire lifetime, they will show you that your vitamin K peaks at day eight of life. That's our God. When he makes a covenant, he knows every detail about us. And he tells us what's going to be best for us. But yet, while God's route is the best route for us, we know that all too often we think we know better. 
Verse 14 says, Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. Let me ask you something. Were God's guidelines crystal clear? They were. You were either in or you're out. And you made the choice. He would hold his end of the bargain. The question is, would you? But by applying this background knowledge, it helps us understand what is going on in the text with Moses. Moses, as we're going to see, was not circumcised. And so had he identified himself as an Israelite? No. He was about to go to Pharaoh, and he hadn't even held his end of the bargain. And some people would say, but, but Pastor Robert, he didn't know any better. He was an Egyptian. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. He didn't really know better. We don't even know if Jethro was an Israelite because he was in Midian. And so he just didn't know. No one really told him. It's not his fault. That's what my six-year-old told me as he was trying to sneak his Pokemon cards to school this week. I didn't know better, Dad. No, we told you. But I didn't know. No, you knew. And you're sneaking them anyways, right? Or that's like my four-year-old as we're walking into school and he doesn't let me hold his hand anymore because he's Mr. Big and Independent. And he's looking. I go, Owen, there's a pole. Owen, there's a pole. Doink! I didn't know, Dad. I told you five times. There was a pole. It's a kid in basketball who says, they pick up the ball. I watch this all the time. It's wild. They pick up the ball, and they run it like it's a football, drop their shoulder, and then try to shoot the hoop. And the ref calls traveling, and they're like, I didn't know. That's no excuse. Stop it. We do that with God all the time. But I didn't know. Well, guess what? If you're here today, now you know. And we'll get to the covenant part, because this is all old covenant. There's hope with new covenant. But you know. You know. Don't say it like I don't know. Because God told Moses what was going to happen. What did he say in verse 23? But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. This is what he said would happen to Pharaoh, right? Right? Do you remember this? I'm back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 23 now. And he says, since you're going to refuse Pharaoh, I'm going to take your firstborn son. Okay, God, seriously, you're all about killing your horrible God. Here's a couple things to note. One, why was God going to do this to the Egyptians? Because Pharaoh ignored nine other warnings. We're going to get to that. That's what's going to happen. But Pharaoh would ignore warning after warning after warning. And I'm sorry, but when all the frogs went like upside down, that stench would have been enough for me. All right, God. It's clear. The locusts and all the things, it's, it's wild. And so God, it's like he has to up the measure to the point that finally something extreme enough would happen. For Pharaoh. And that's the surface level. But what else? We always say God is a just God. He's a God of justice. When, when my kid is, is bullied or picked on for some reason, I tell him, no, don't worry about handling it yourself, right? Why? Because we believe in a God who is the one who is going to hold people accountable, right? It's not for you to go punch the kid in the face again. Jesus says to turn the other cheek. And so here's the thing that we see here. How is God going to hold the Egyptians accountable? What did Pharaoh do to all the firstborn babies of the Israelites? He had them drowned. Do you remember that? They would have a son, and he would make them drown them in the Nile River. The reason we have Moses is because we have these women who stepped out in faith and they said, you know what, I'm going to end up my part, whatever I can do, I'm going to do to fight this injustice of Pharaoh. And they put the baby in the reed basket and raised the baby and took care of the baby in all these different ways. We looked at that at the first week. But here's the point to it. Pharaoh is not innocent. The Egyptians are not innocent. 
And there has to be justice. But back to Moses, he's stuck between two identities. Is he an Egyptian or is he an Israelite? God was about to set the Israelites free from bondage, but it was going to come at a great cost. Not a cost because God was mean and vicious, but at a cost because of the many warning signs, Pharaoh was not going to respect or obey God. And if Moses didn't identify as an Israelite, follow me here, Moses' son would be identified as an Egyptian and not an Israelite come the Passover. And by warning them now, God is protecting both Moses and his firstborn son from what would happen later. See, if, if Moses ignored this warning sign, Passover would have come, and guess what? Would Moses and his son be circumcised? No. And so what would have happened? Would they be grafted in, a part of that firstborn family of God, the Israelites? No, they wouldn't. And so, God comes and he's about to kill Moses. Not because he's a horrible God, but because he's a loving, gracious, caring, and all-knowing God. And then what happens? The wife comes to the rescue, as all of us men know. Come on, men. We know this. Time and time again, we think we know best, and our wife saves our butt. I use that part because I'm not going to get into the details of this next verse. Verse 25. Moses' wife, Sephora, she took a flint knife and she circumcised her son. She touched her, his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are the bridegroom of blood to me. And when she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. What did Zephora do? She stepped in, and she made sure the circumcision happened. She made sure that Moses' son was now identified as an Israelite. Zephora took matters into her own hands. It was not the actions of Moses that would spare them, but the actions of his wife, Zephora. Moses and his whole family were now identified as gods. They were Israelites. And Moses and his family now had a solid identity. And now they could go to Pharaoh. We're going to see in the new covenant, there's someone who steps in and takes care of us as well. His name is Jesus. And just like Zephora stepped in and took care of her family, Jesus steps in and takes care of ours. And it's not because we did our part of the deal. It's because he does his part of the deal, and he makes sure that we're made right with God. We'll get into it. But that's what happens. And here we get a picture in Exodus of what is to come in the New Covenant. You could really break the Bible into New Testament or Old Testament. I actually say you could do it new coven Old Covenant and New Covenant. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. But what do we know about the Israelites? We're going to follow this journey. In Joshua chapter 5, go a little further in the Bible, Joshua chapter 5. Anyone recall what happened here? They're about to enter the promised land. They see the promised land. It's right there. It's just across the river. All they have to do is cross that river. And what happens? God says, but you guys aren't circumcised. Because while you guys were journeying for 40 years in the desert, you, you forgot about the agreement we made. And now you want all the blessing, but you don't want any of the agreement on your end, do you? And so he says, I don't care how old you are. <laughs> you got to do it again. And he makes sure all the men are circumcised. And we see this weird passage in Scripture where all the men are just crying and they're just in a lot of pain and sad. Joshua chapter 5, if you're looking for biblical entertainment. But when they're in the wilderness, they forget their end of the deal. And that's what we see happens over and over again with the Israelites. We always say we're going to hold our end of the deal. 
But then we forget our end of the deal. And when we do this, it often leads to more pain than necessary, like it did for the Israelites. In verses 27 to 31, we see that Moses and Aaron are united, and now they're on this mission to go talk to the leaders of Israel. Fast forwarding to verse 31, it says, Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron And when they had heard that the Lord was concerned about them, they had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. We see the leaders of the Israelites are meeting with Moses and Aaron. And do you remember, Moses was the one who they're like, he had killed the Egyptians, and the Israelites were like, well, you know, basically, who are you? Get away from us. And that's why he flees to Midian. And now he comes back with Moses, and he's super nervous. I guarantee he's nervous. Because he told God five different reasons why he was nervous or why he couldn't do it. And so he comes and Aaron, because, you know, he couldn't speak for himself. He needed his brother to save him. Comes in and they talk to these leaders. And these leaders are so moved by what they say that they do what? They bow down and worship. Are they worshiping Moses and Aaron? No. They're worshiping God. And why? Because he sent Moses and Aaron. Because he heard their cry. And he was going to set them free of hundreds of years of slavery, harsh labor, and a horrible life in many ways. And God was going to step in. And so they bow down in worship because God was concerned about them. And when we know that God cares about us, follow me here, when we know that God cares about us, we're moved to worship him as well. If God cares about me, little old me, i got to praise and worship him. And so here's the question for you. Do you know that he cares about you and loves you and stepped in for you? The Israelites' journey, we will see time and time again, you just want to, like, hit your head with their decision-making. I'll never forget a childhood pastor said, God's forehead must be flat. Darn it again and again and again. But you know what? We're no different than the Israelites. We tell God time and time again, like that story of Jack last week, God, I'll do anything for you until he asks us to do something he wants us to do. But we have a good God who no matter how flat we've made his forehead, figuratively, he cares about us. In Hebrews chapter 8, I want to read these verses for you. It says this, But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If you need a verse to memorize, that is a good one. Hold fast to that verse. Hold on to that verse. But it doesn't stop there. If the first covenant has been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. In other words, if this first one was great, why did we need a second one? So then he goes on. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will be not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant. So I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. And so what does God make a new covenant with? We find it in several of the gospel passages, but here's the one from Matthew 26, verse 28. 
This is my blood. Who is speaking? Jesus. Which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus would shed his own blood. Jesus would come into the world, as John would put, the word would become flesh and would dwell among us. Jesus would come and he would be rejected and he would be spit on and despised and he would shed his own blood. Why? Because he was the sacrificial lamb that brought in a new covenant between us and God. And that covenant is a beautiful covenant because we're stuck in this land between. Are we a Christ follower or are we not? And so many of us are stuck in that tension. I've been on a journey recently. I have a goal to read the 10 most influential books in atheism. And you're like, seriously? Like, why does the pastor read a book on atheism? In the journey, number one, I go to the library for them because I don't want to buy them for my own. I don't want to support that. Number two, the library has them, and it's cheap, so that's good. But here's the reason why. Because in our society, 40% of people identify as a religious nun. What does that mean? That they just didn't know better. There might be a God. I think there's a God. But I don't want to make a decision if there is or not. And how many of us are stuck in that land between? Some of us in this room might be stuck in that land between. But God's done his part because he sent his son. He shed his blood. He went to the cross. He rose from the grave. And he said, it is done and it is finished. The question is, are we doing our part? Well, but Pastor Robert, it's by grace you are saved, not by works, so that no man can boast. Well, here's your Moses warning. It is by faith that you are saved. Do you truly believe the message of Jesus Christ? That's the question. Do you truly believe he is who he says he is? Do you truly believe he is the Son of God? Do you truly believe he is the spotless lamb? Do you truly believe he did die, he was buried, and he did raise from the grave? And if you say, I believe it, guess what? You held up your end of the deal. But guess what? It changes you, and it changes the way you live, and it changes what you worship, and it changes how you go about your day. And so my prayer is that we would heed the warning signs. That we wouldn't be naive and say, I didn't know. That we wouldn't be like that Harry Truman on Mount St. Helen, and after months of warning signs says, eh, it might not come. But we would hear the promises of God. We'll hear that Jesus says, I am coming again for my bride. And who is his bride? The church. Who is the church? Those who profess him and call on his name as Savior and Lord. Will you pray with me?